Hi everyone, my name is Beth Roberts and I work for Landessa. We're an international organization that works to secure rights to land for those who live in rural areas, depend on land for a living, and lack legal rights to the land. land. Uh, we've worked in over 50 countries and we've been around for a little over 50 years. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about how land tenure and land governance ties to the conference theme of transforming food systems in a changing climate. I'm excited to be joining you remotely. Sorry I won't be able to join you in Bali this week. I uh, hope you're all having a lovely time. So why is land tenure and land governance so important to um, implementing global agendas? So I'm going to talk about co-implementing sustainable, develop sustainable development goals, human rights frameworks, and climate change frameworks, and how that all relates to climate smart agriculture. So Landessa is exploring this work particularly in our work in Myanmar, in Tanzania, and in Kenya, working with governments and civil society actors on getting people into the same room, essentially getting actors that are active on these global agendas and responsible for implementing them at the national level into the same room to talk about how they can be more coordinated and efficient, working across government agencies, being more inclusive of civil society, and the reason for that is that there's so much overlap in implementation and enforcement, in particular between the Sustainable Development Goals and human rights frameworks. There's the high-level political forum, there's treaty monitoring body um, cycles for countries, and there's also implementation that happens on the ground of those decisions. So how does that relate to climate change and to climate smart agriculture? So the Sustainable Development Goals serve as a results-oriented roadmap for uh, sustainable development and also for human rights frameworks and for climate change. And they mention land in goals one and five specifically, and they also relate to land through the goals on climate change, on institutions, on life on land that talks about land degradation. 52% of agricultural land worldwide is degraded, and that ties obviously very closely to food systems and in incredibly closely to the empowerment of smallholder farmers. Um, land is also tied to inequality at the national level and to si sustainable institutions under Goal 16. So land institutions are particularly crucial for peace and security, for anti-corruption, and for empowerment of those who are most marginalized within societies. So land tenure and land governance also ties to the sub-themes of the conference with empowering women and youth and farmers and strengthening and innovating within institutions and supporting climate smart agricultural practices. Land tenure, there's a growing body of evidence that shows that strong land tenure, especially for women, um, can contribute to uptake of climate smart agricultural practices and more sustainable use of land. So following practices, agroforestry practices, soil management practices, tree planting, things that we know contribute to mitigation and adaptation efforts that slow migration, that increase resiliency for marginalized uh, people who are most impacted by climate change. Um, but what needs to happen to incentivize their uptake of climate smart practices and to protect their rights in the face of the onslaught and the crisis of climate change? People with rights to land are incentivized to make improvements to their land, are protected from outside actors, and are able to assert their rights uh, when families, companies, governments, or other actors infringe on those rights. Um, so we work to strengthen governance through institutional support, through support to directly to communities, and to support through these institutions that are implementing these global agendas. And a coordinated effort to involve the people that are actually impacted by climate change as data gatherers for the sustainable development goals, as reporters on human rights frameworks, and as implementers and actors for climate smart agricultural processes, and then feeding that information into reporting structures and enforcement structures, building the, the governance structure between that very grassroots level and the global levels, and, and harmonizing these frameworks at the national level so that actors that have low capacity and in low resources and environments can make the best use of their resources for the greatest impact for those who are most impacted by climate change. Thanks for your time today. If you would like to learn more, please contact us at, or go to our website at landessa.org or contact me at bethr at landessa.org. My name is uh, Liang Yu. You know, I came uh, from IPRI or the set. So today I'm introducing this uh, Satisfy project, the Satellite Technology Innovation and Smart Finance Food Security. You can see I'm trying to, you know, it's only five minutes, so 
I put a lot of things here. So that is a really public-private partnership program. In fact, from public sector, we have IPRIS leading, which is I'm the lead, uh, project leader at Cornell University, University of Greenwich. And more important, the private sector. You can see there's not a lot of banks. Equity Bank, Kenya Commercial Bank, APA Insurance, or in, uh, and the Agri-Food uh, Economic so Africa, or in Kenya, yeah. and Swiss Re. Right. You are talking and real money, so you're talking banks here. Um, the concept we're trying to say is called the risk of contingent credit. This is RCC, if you like. This is an innovative market-based market -based risk management solution. Risk contingent credit, as I saw here, is a bundled financial product embedded in structured insurance protection. This two, two paragraph here, hopefully I get this work. So if you look the from the farmer's well. point of view, so actually you, you borrow money from the bank, you know, the interest may be a little bit higher than the regular loans, but however, you know, if you are, you know, it's higher, but if you have like a trigger, some kind of disaster year, the crop doesn't work, so you actually doesn't need to pay back the loans, you know, actually, you know, the insurance take part. And even from insurance bank point of view, you can see here, Actually, you know, of course, it's well said it's market based, you know. And then if it's regular year, you just get get your in, get your premium, get the, the insurance gets the premium and the bank get their their interest and the loans. But in the bad year, when the bad year happens, the actually the insurance will have to pay out, you know. This is a this whole uh, advantage of uh, insurance. And uh, you can you can see so The trigger, the trigger also is important. In the dashed line, this trigger says it's here we use the index insurance. If you know the index insurance, we use rainfall. Here, this is satellite coming in. We also use soil, soil um, the satellite basic soil, soil, moisture, uh, soil, soil moisture. Sometimes, you know, if you know the insurance, we also use NDVI. This is also satellite based index. Of course, we are not just talk about theory. Actually, we are. I mean, the important part, as I said, is actually the, real, the, the implementation. Here, we really literally put our, our money where our mouth is. So we actually, you know, the first pilot, IPRI piloted this project in Kenya in 2017, even took first in 2017, to about 1,200 households in Machaco County, County Kenya. Over there, you know, because of research, you know, this is where count risk. We actually divided by randomization, use uh, uh, the, the about 1,200 uh, farmers into three groups. One is the RCC with RCC loans. The other one is without, you know, just regular loans. The third one is the control group. You know, if you your columns, you know why we do that. Actually, we found in this 2017, the the RCC loans update rate is much higher than that. And there, I'm not sure if you're Kenya, you know what happened in 2017? First of all, 2017, there is a drought. There was a drought in 2017. I would never say drought is good, right? But from the point of view of risk contingent credit, it's a huge promotion for us. Actually, for those farmers who take the RCC I loans, the actually they are, they are only pay half they only pay half of the loans back to the bank, and the, re the other half paid by the insurance. Of course, the regular loans you have to pay in full. So, and another one happened, which if you know the politics in 2017 in Kenya, Kenya, you know, this is a presidential election, actually, this, this news, this violence in, in 2017, right? So this, you know, nobody can predict such a risk, right? So that one, you know, you can imagine because it's very practical, of course, it'll affect our implementation in Kenya. So in that year, so our implementation have some trouble. Luckily, with help with a global resident part of our donor, I think David is here, so we have another chance. This year, actually, this is the second time in 2019, actually just two months ago, we went to the field again. First, we will keep this, we will implement the same thing in Machaco County, you know, keep the same RCT design. But on the other hand, we also expanded this program, this program, this time with another bank, Kenya Commercial Bank, and about, you know, about 1,000 farmers in Embu County, another county in Kenya. This, Actually, here we showed a few pictures to show what is really happening over there, and so a few maps where Machaco and, and Kenya is. Uh, finding so far, so in that one, you know, I don't know if this, uh, we all do some implementations. The so finding so far, farmers understand RCC, why RCC is important, understand the, this high interest rate. But on the other hand, we also, because no upfront payment and no collaterals, so this is a more financial, kind of inclu uh, inclusive. 
the financial education is very important. Financial training, yeah. It's not just financial training. A lot of farmers actually, the first time ever, for them actually have, have a, 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 a bank account, let alone, you know, or, you know, relatively complicated, complicated uh, uh, financial product. Also, we do have some kind of agronomic training because you, you have to teach farmers not just financial literacy, also agronomic, you know, what kind of fertilizer you should buy, what kind of uh, 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 seed you should buy. Uptake in the RCC is higher than the, than the uh, uh, regular ones also. The majority of farmers actually have used certified times for the first time. So um, in, the, in, the, in the end, I don't have a named time. So nowadays, everything's online. If you Google actually satisfy and EPRI, you will find everything actually on the EPRI website. We have two rounds of surveys. This data is there. We also have journal papers as a researcher. We validate also newspaper and TV radio. We even have professional funded uh, YouTube video. Also, uh, so if you still have time on your, uh, on your luggage, I'll put some, uh, some kind of postcard on the registration desk. You can just pick up from there. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Lang Xi. So my name is Peter Laderach, and I work for CCAFs, and I'm seconded to EFAB and WFP. So every morning when I get up, I have to figure out what office I'm going to go to. And uh, so it's very exciting. I'm very passionate to see how climate science can be uh, um, leveraged to help guide uh, WFP and EFAB programming. So I'm going to give a few examples of that uh, work. So first of all, a topic that we haven't talked about this week, uh, climate and, and conflict. So of course, uh, we all acknowledge that there is uh, some linkage between uh, conflict and food security and climate, so, so the nexus of, of those, those three. So here, an analysis that we condu conducted that shows like hotspots of where climate variability is high and, um, and fatalities uh, due to conflicts are high also. So the, the brown uh, dots that you can see are hotspots like Horn of Africa, um, Sahel, uh, Northern Africa and Southern Africa. So it's where, where high climate variability and fatal conflicts coincide. Of course, there's no um, causal linkage. It's just happening in the same time and um, space envelope. So that's why we then uh, looked at, uh, the, at the literature in the Horn of Africa here to see what the drivers are of uh, uh, so how do you get from climate variability to conflict. So what is uh, reported in, in, in papers, in peer-reviewed publications. So you can see here all the different colored bars are kind of the, the, the drivers, the intermediate drivers. So there's no straight line from uh, climate variability to conflict. So it uh, goes through drought, flood, water scarcity, uh, decrease in yield, shocks, and then you, uh, at some point, you get to, um, to conflict. So this was uh, uh, very important to, to understand. And of course, uh, EFAD and WFP, CCAFs, and all of us, we basically work on those drivers, right? We work on insurance, we work on forecast-based finance, we work on, on food security program. So s somehow we support peace building or prospect to, to peace, right? So, so that's what, what, what we're uh, here. So we're still digging and trying to find the, the evidence and those linkages. Um, so what we then did, um, we did a portfolio analysis in WFP and EFAT. So we went through, through all the documents and databases and, and mapped their activities along uh, resilience continuum. So what you can see is that um, uh, WFP is, is, of course, working more at a lower level of resilience, absorptive and adaptive uh, capacities because they're a humanitarian aid agency, whereas uh, EFAD is more working on the, on the, low, on the, on the upper um, continuum of, of, the, of the resilience continuum, more uh, around the resilience building. But, of course, uh, by uh, those two agencies working very closely together, there's a great opportunity to lift uh, people out of food insecurity into, um, into resilience and, and, and uh, yeah, food security. So, um, okay, next slide. So we then uh, got, of course, very excited because uh, uh, working uh, as a scientist in EFAD and WFP is, is like a, a little child in Disneyland because they have so much data, right? So there's data everywhere. So we started to to um, look, at in, look at all those databases and reports and, and start uh, uh, mapping, mapping it in, in a dashboard. So to see, um, first of all, progress on their programming, but also progress on, 
on uh, transformation, progress towards systematic change. So it has be really been very exciting and interesting and spurred a lot of uh, interest and, and discussion because once you have like all this data in a dashboard, it, it becomes live and interactive and people can, can, um, can take different decisions. So it's all about combining different, different type of data sets to get uh, new insights that we wouldn't have had uh, just looking at, at data sets uh, separately. Um, then, of course, we were also interested in in uh, what makes uh, adaptation projects success successful. So we looked at, uh, at a few examples here. And um, so, of course, uh, we found that it's very context specific. I mean, those things that we, that we always would find. But uh, also, um, there is some threats for successful projects. So it's, for, exa for example, coordination of national capacities, of course, good project management, scalability. And then uh, one uh, factor that came up uh, across all the successful projects is that they all had a very, very strong uh, component of innovation. So which kind of closes nicely my, my speech here since I, I started uh, talking about uh, being passionate about the innovation and research and to see how how this can help to support uh, WFP and EFAT uh, programming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, so I come from an organization with a long and proud history of engagement in research for development. Uh, we've been around uh, working with a lot of organizations here since uh, 1960, and of course, with ups and downs, like many other organizations. And for that, we are somehow resilient in some ways. Um, perhaps what made us resilient is our strong adherence to the core teachings and philosophy of our founder, Dr. James Yen, which remain true and relevant until today. He always believed in unlocking the potential of any individual to do more, if only given the right tools and uh, options. And that's why in our organization, we are always reminded that we should not try to be agents of change, but rather agents of learning. I'm going to share how we think we did just that in promoting CSA to farmers and local governments, first in one town and later on to more towns in at least one province in the Philippines. Social learning played a critical role in making it happen. First, it provided a more scientific approach to the way farmers and local extension agents learn about not just new technologies, but also indigenous practices and the opportunities both to bring to them in terms of food security, livelihood, nutrition, and its relevance to the environment in general. Second, uh, it also provided them options, not just to specific technologies or practices, but to the many other opportunities that agricultural research offers nowadays. Third, it provided local governments concrete basis how it can reconstruct its services to farmers and efficiently uh, allocate resources to benefit the most number of farmers. And lastly, uh, it provided the observable basis for sharing the collective experiences of farmers and local governments to others outside the locality. So we all know that farmers will find a way to adapt to whatever situation they are facing, and that includes climate change impacts. In one way or another, uh, they will stumble upon new practices and they will adapt and, in and innovate if it makes sense to them, food-wise and money-wise. So CSA will spread from farmer to farmer even without promoters like us, but the process may take time because farmers, uh, at least in the Philippines, usually have a wait-and-see approach to new things. And that's why participatory action research among farmers is more relevant than ever because of the underpinning theme of urgency in the climate change discussion. Uh, action research is not new, uh, yes, but in this case, we were not focused and did not start on any uh, specific technology, but emphasize more on what the farmers are interested in, their learning or research agenda. What they think would work based best would work best to help them cope up with the increasing uncertainty in farming due to climate change. Uh, this entails uh, on-the-ground community work to helping farmers uh, conduct a more systematic way of conducting and uh, documenting field trials and observations. It also requires establishing networks of partners, especially other nearby successful farmers and local research stations, which usually already have good amount of research derived knowledge and experiences on specific technologies. Uh, farmers' interests will be diverse, of course, especially in the multi-commodity production systems. And this is where the value of uh, 
Community Innovations Fund come in. Uh, we don't know yet what technology or practices farmers would be interested, but we need to be ready to make it accessible for them at the soonest time, and you need resources to make it happen. In the Philippines, uh, government funds uh, support to farmers are usually allocated for a very specific items and, and, and goes through a quite a long process before it becomes available to them. Um, the Innovation Fund fills in that gap and provides farmers readily available and flexible funds for testing new things. Uh, it also minimizes risk for farmers to try unfamiliar production techniques, which gives them uh, more conv confidence to try new ones and thus accelerate participatory action researches. A uh, payback mechanism is, of course, worked out and fund management system is set up. But the minimum requirement is for those who avail of it to share what they have learned and neighbors to their neighbors and fellow farmers. Uh, the Innovation Fund also allowed farmers and extension agents to agree on what type of uh, support systems to establish. These are usually uh, plant nurseries, crop propagation centers, breeding centers, like. Um, and lastly, the point of conducting all this is to uh, spread and scale out learnings more than the technology to more farmers and local government. Uh, but this, even this process should be provided with some structure to make it more effective. We help farmers and local uh, government design and structure field days, roving workshops, field visits, as well as set up uh, learning sites so that knowledge sharing among farmers, local governments, any, anyone is more effective and, and efficient. So, and uh, that somehow, uh, is our point that uh, CSA technologies uh, will not be enough. Uh, we need social learning also, and we need the uh, support systems. So, so thank you. Thank you, Renee. Prisma is a development project. Um, we focus in agriculture, and it is funded by the Australian government and the Indonesian government. And we adopt the uh, market system development approach where we test commercial business case and business model for private to further invest. And one of the components is on the CSI strategies. Um, for the constraint in one of the province in the eastern part of Indonesia, NTT, um, the dry climate and the lack of capacities of the farmers and also the private players in the regions limit the uh, growth of the maize sector in the province. But we also see the opportunities that the maize seed and grain demands are increasing and there is a open pollinated variety seeds that is heat and drought tolerant, higher yield, short season uh, cultivation, longer shelf life and suitable for consumptions like what the NTT people do. So what we do is we facilitating local seed producers and the government to increase the productivity and to improve the promotion and uh, distribution strategies. We are not only achieve quite number, significant numbers of farmers benefiting, increasing their income from the project, but it will, we also see that further investment are put in by the uh, private sector. Now, other initiatives we had is like one example, we would have the uh, hybrid rice seed where we improve the capacities of the seed producers, where we can expect further um, impact relev relevant to the environments and also the climate mitigation is on the maximizing the land, less water of fertile areas, the reductions of fertilizer and pesticide use. We also endorse the seed producers to um, do the intercropping and to promote that practice so that that can improve the soil fertility, improving the productivity, and also spread the climate risk, particularly on diversifying the incomes for the farmers. We also work with the irrigation service providers so that they can improve their capacity, knowledge, knowledge and technicality so that we see in the, in, in the field that they shift the use of fuel-based uh, uh, energy into the electricity and solar power. And we also see that the farmers getting more services uh, through the irrigation, adding more planting season. And also, we also see the, the changes in terms of um, the water, the reductions of water lost. Now, what we do uh, in Prisma in relevant to the CSA, we analyze and integrate the thinking, the practice, the opportunity, the constraint in the design phase, 
And then we, with the support of our um, environment strategy and framework, we further assess the technicality and the potentials of their practices and initiative, whether that can be um, achievable and scale up by the farmers and also by the private players. And then we measured for the improvement, not only for improving the business case and also the business model, but we also want to learn and improve the strategies overall so that we can further produce a commercial case study, a potential business model for the private sector to scale up and to further invest in the CSA initiative or practices. What we have seen so far is that actually the privates are eager to move forward to a better uh, sustainable agriculture practices to secure the supply, um, sustaining their businesses, but also to benefiting farmers as their partners or consumers. We see that actually involving the privates does not mean that we will sacrifice the livelihood of the farmers. It doesn't mean that we also need to sacrifice the environment, but actually we can join those two components together so that the achievement not only from the business side, but also from the improvement of livelihood of the farmers can be achievable. If you want to further know a little bit more about what Prisma do in these uh, notions and the implementation, you can reach me out, we can discuss it further. Uh, Andrew mentioned earlier this morning about the involvement of private sector and that's what we uh, typically do and I'm also eager to learn also from all of you here. Thank you. So I'm talking about flood-based rangeland restoration, Afar, Ethiopia. Now, if anyone knows Afar, it's an extremely dry area, two to 300 millimetres of rainfall and lower, uh, surrounded by a lot of the highlands of, of highland areas around Ethiopia. These are much higher rainfall areas. I'm presenting this on behalf of Dr. Tilahuna Medi, who's the country director for ICRASAT in Ethiopia. And I'm coming from uh, headquarters of ICRASAT, which is the International Crop Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics. Um, a lot of this work has been done with uh, collaboration with GIZ in Ethiopia and it's been supported by um, the CRP, Water, Land and Ecosystems, which is one of these other integrative CRPs. It's a really amazing story, so I hope you can listen to this. Um, it's very much about changing uh, the paradigm of, of traditional livelihoods which are being uh, threatened or changed by a whole range of drivers, not just climate change, but very much land degradation, overstocking, loss of pastoral resources, um, and of course climate change and extreme events really challenging these traditionally based livelihoods which were based on pastoralists. And these, these people who are affected severely by poverty are affected by both floods and droughts and often in the same season. In 2017, more than 300,000 people were affected by drought. And this, is, this story is not just relevant for uh, lowland Ethiopia, it's relevant right across uh, eastern and southern Africa with estimates of around a million people at risk uh, each year from, from flood events. And we, we all know the drought events. Um, in the local language of, of the Afari people, they, they had three words for how they describe the seasons. Uh, the first one is Kerma, which is the primary rain, rainy season from June to September. The next one was Dida, um, an occasional rainfall in December. And the next one was Seagum, which is the minor rains in March and April. I hope I pronounced those correctly, but one of the, the pastoralists, one of the lead agro-pastoralists we were working with, Ahmed Wogris, said what is left is only the name of the season, so that's a little bit depressing. Now this intervention, which was initially put in by GIZ, was to control the major flooding events that happen seasonally onto the lowlands. As I said, it's rainfall coming from the highlands at high velocity, causing major destruction in the lowlands. And GIZ put in these water spreading weir structures, which when the flood comes down from the highlands, it hits these barriers, it slows the velocity of the water, sedimentation occurs, and water kind of spreads out across the plain. Um, so avoiding some of the, the issues you have with gully erosion and, and, and land degradation. So here we have a couple of pictures of, of uh, the intervention being put in place with the community, uh, some water flowing across these structures and, and people being able to 
walk across and pass these areas. But this is only half the story, really. What, what you have to also put in is the livelihoods. And this is where the story gets really interesting. This partnership between GIZ, who identified this initial problem, between ICRASAT that brought in a lot of the agricultural intensification, created the local partnerships, introduced best practices, and created local capacity. And of course, the NARS, the um, local NGOs working to support the local action, develop the community facilitation, design the bylaws, and most importantly, I would say, is the community. And they were contributing the, the labor, growing crops, um, and it, for many of these farmers, it was the first time that they were actually bringing in um, uh, farm-based activities. And, and as a result, they had to create bylaws and, and collective action. And so over a three-year period, the last three years, uh, ICRASAT and its partners designed how these land areas, these small land areas, could be actually used for farming and not just rangelands. And this resulted in um, different crops that could be designed for different parts of the landscape, areas where there's deeper soils, where the silt is accumulated, where there's water in the profile. These would be suitable for some of the longer duration crops. And so through a, a science-based approach, we identified the soils, uh, the right crop types, and we adjusted management to, be, um, to bring the best possible result. And some of the results were, over the last three years, was major pr uh, production over... Um, 50 or 60 hectares in these small areas of uh, a whole range of crops and legumes and fodders. And, th and that's just a, a really nice picture of, of the whole landscape once you put in these water spreading weirs. So it's a great story. Um, I haven't given, given it justice, but there's a lot of flies out next to the water, land and ecosystems booth outside that you can look through this. To scale this up, we looked at where this um, may be applicable and we looked at Sentinel-1 and the potential area for flood-based interventions across two of the seasons in, in Ethiopia was between 0.5 and 1.2 million hectares. These interventions could certainly make AFAR more food secure and reduce its vulnerability. And the government of Ethiopia is keen to replicate with a, a lot of visits from senior ministers. And as I said, it's highly applicable to the lowlands right across East and Southern Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, Yeah, good afternoon. This was not planned, but we thought it would be interesting to just highlight a little bit with you the, the work we have been doing over the last three years at high level, collaborating with the private sector, and namely the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, a platform that you might know gathers more than 200 companies. And the little story I want to tell is that it has been a pretty good and interesting learning curve, I, I, I think, from both sides. They, they came to us because they, they wanted to see how they could improve the way they are trying to support SDG commitments and the contribution to the Paris Agreement. So I would just highlight three different phases we have came through in the last two years, and I think it's pretty a good and quick evolution. The first thing we did is that the CCAF's um, team working on adaptation, where I belong, and also the mitigation team, were asked to, to handle a workshop in Vermont, in the US, where we managed to try to, in more operational terms, um, somehow help them understand what actually CSA means and how much of what they are doing and measuring of their contributions fits already with the metrics of CSA. Um, so this was a kind of very kind of capacity building exercise that led then to, to World Business Council to set up a CSA 100 initiatives, which basically aims to mobilize all the companies to try to set up targets, specific targets, on how they can contribute to the progress on the three pillars of CSA. So that happened last year, and now this year we have been moving into something more practical, and is basically trying to collectively build a guide that can help them to set targets on productivity uh, and food losses, on resilience, climate resilience, building climate resilience through the value chain and with farming communities, and then also to set up mitigation targets, which I would say is the easiest part of the story. So how we have done this? So 
I will talk from, from the adaptation side of things, with, which is where I, has been, I have been involved so far. We came through an interview of different types of companies. So we interview input providers, um, um, brands, financial providers, brands, uh, producers. So we came to get to better know Olam, Bayer, Rabobank, Unilever, and try to also understand how they operate, to which extent they already incorporate climate risk into their risk management strategies, and how we could create a tool that is simple enough but useful to help them set top targets both first in climate resilience assessments if they are not already doing that, and second in how to select specific resilience building actions, either directly uh, with, farmers, uh, with farming communities if they are the type of companies that are already connected to the bottom of the, of the production, or to do it through the value chain. So, Right now, I mean, we, we went through these interviews with the companies. We're basically finalizing the, the guide with these three, three pillars and how to set science-based targets on those three pillars. And we expect this guide to be launched maybe in, in a month, a month and a half. And hopefully, this will be a more practical instrument that will guide the companies of how better to set up the targets to really more clearly show how they are contributing to, C, uh, to SDGs and, and, and to CSA and Paris Agreement um, commitments. Fantastic, Osana.